Hello everyone, my name is uh, Dr. Joel Rosen and today I want to present to you another case study uh, of a patient that we're working with, specifically a patient who doesn't know she has PCOS before she comes to my office. She, it, we're not going to use any names, she has given me permission to share this information provided I don't give you her name um, because this is a good learning experience for anyone that may be dealing with uh, a child or a grandchild or even themselves that happen to be watching this and is dealing with PCOS symptoms. So PCOS, particularly the diagnosis, requires three uh, criterias to be met, um, or two out of three, sorry. And so multiple polycystic string of pearls, um, fibroids, um, or cysts um, need to be present um, for, the, for one of the criteria of the diagnosis. The other criteria is confirm androgen excess, which you're going to see today on this particular case study. Um, we use Dutch tests exclusively. If you are suffering with or someone that you know is suffering with this type of problem, then the Dutch test is really what you need to do. And, and I can tell you a little more information about that as we go along. And then so confirmed androgen excess, which we're going to talk about today, is a second uh, symptom or sub second criteria. And that would require um, not only confirmed estrogen or test, blah, sorry, that would require not only confirmed androgen excess, but that would have the associated subjective complaints. So uh, anger, hostility, irritability, mood disturbances, um, and also the objective findings of hair growth in places that they don't want it in their lip, on their face, on their breasts, on their back, um, acne, uh, cystic acne, stuff like that. So, um, and then the third third uh, variable is menstrua menstrual cycles, uh, dysregularity. So that could be not having a cycle, having a really long cycle, um, having spotting during the cycle, um, having a really short cycle, um, something that's going to... And really, th those are the three criteria. But if you only have two of the three, which is which may not be the actual cysts, it still fits under the the um, the diagnosis. So, anyways, let's talk about her case. She originally came to see me. She's dealing with gut issues. She talks about having constipation. Um, she also talks about not being able to lose weight, or she's gaining weight. Um, she talks about hormonal imbalances, so she has acne and hair growth. Um, she also has some skin issues. Um, she also has um, uh, bad sleep. And so these are the things that she's dealing with. So we did a Dutch test, and here are the results that we came up with. So we look at, firstly, her, her sex hormones. And that's what's really cool about this test is it tells us not only about her, um, her, her adrenal hormones, but her sex hormones. And we can see that her estrogen levels, which are the sum of eight estrogen metabolites, um, are... Uh, in the upper ranges here, and the interesting thing about this is, is that this period, this particular sample for women that are premenstrual are pre are menstruating, is they have to have um, the sample taken around the um, the 20, 21st day, 19 through 21, where their estrogen would be at the lowest. So we do see that her estrogen levels are a little bit high compared to um, where they should be on the um, when they're peaking in the beginning of the cycle. The estrogen cycle should be um, high in the beginning and low at the end. And, and progesterone is the opposite. And that's why we want to take a look at the 19 through 21 day sample because we want to see how well her progesterone is doing. And she's obviously She's having a, a big, strong release of progesterone, um, but look at her testosterone. Her testosterone is above the, uh, the ideal ranges of where they should be. It's an interesting drawing. Um, and then we look at her cortisol levels and her adrenal hormones. So we talked about our sex hormones. Those are produced by the female tissues, now or the female reproductive system. Now we are looking at her adrenal hormones. And what we can see is we can see that she is through the roof of her free cortisol. And what that is, is that represents how much cortisol she has at any one time. Because this test does four different readings, it does it at, at dinner time, it does it at bedtime, it does it in the morning, and it does two hours later. 
any one time that it is measured, you can see that the average of all of these are above where it should be. So she is um, fighting a, an acute stress response, that something that requires her to um, continually uh, mount a certain amount of cortisol to be able to settle down her stress. And so she's a college student. She has deadlines. She has exams. She has finals. She may not be eating great. She's waiting a long time throughout the day. She's not always having breakfast. She's eating a lot of sugary carbs, um, maybe a lot of stimulants. That could be something that requires her to um, have free cortisol levels be through the roof. Um, but what we look at here is her total metabolized cortisol. And we can see that her total metabolized cortisol is, is very, very high as well. Um, it should be between 2240 and 4300. And she's at 6789. So this value means how much did she spend at the end of the day? So here's how much she spent very, you know, at any one time, and here's how much she spent at the end of the day. So you can see that she's really, really high as well. And then lastly, we can see her DHEA production is really, really high as well. So she has um, confirmed androgen excess or confirmed um, hormonal stress and that's through the um, adrenal profile um, mainly through the DHEA and we can see that she's through the roof so DHEA is sort of our reserves when we get stressed out we have exams we have uh, maybe an infection which we're going to talk about in a second we have leakiness of our gut and we're eating foods that we're reacting to and you combine all of those things and she is going to secrete way more hormone hormones that the adrenals make and even the sex hormones make and that's why you're seeing her DHE levels go really really high. So let's go to the next page on here and we can take a look and take see how well she is breaking down her hormones and that's what's really great about this test is it takes a look and, and tells us okay how is she doing with her metabolites so let's take a look here so we can see that her DHEA as we know she's 19 years old she should be between 3 30 and 350 and she is at 645 so that is super super high um, typically our DHEA S is our sulfated version of DHEA and what that basically means is when we have increased inflammation we have upregulation of our sulfur um, production and that's what you're seeing is she's producing a lot of inflammation um, control mechanisms where she's producing a lot of DHEA and when you look at how well DHEA breaks down it breaks down into two things basically it goes into testosterone so she's going this way and you can see that that's still high I get a lot of patients that have high DHEA but then low testosterone and something's happening there and then testosterone can go over and over it can aromatize and produce um, estrogen and in her case you can see her E2 is really really high as well her E1 is a little bit um, towards the upper limit and her E3 is um, towards the middle half. We'll talk about that in a second. Now we can see her androstenedione. So this is basically a function of how well she metabolizes her DHEA. And one of the things that we look at is we look at the difference between 5-alpha and 5-beta. And what does that mean? Well, 5-alpha is the more potent androgen metabolite, meaning when we break down um, androstenedione, we have two directions in which we can break it down with our liver metabolism. And this is highly controlled by our enzymes. And this is where 23andMe tests come in and we can look at polymorphisms and see is there a down regulation of this enzyme and that's why this is high. Is there a down regulation of this enzyme and that's why this is high. And then we can make some nutrition supplement recommendations to try to help the enzyme that's not working so well or try to shut down the enzyme that's overproducing. In her case you can see that her 5-alpha metabolism is right in the middle and so what does that mean? Well it means number one we could probably give her something that's gonna shut down her 5-alpha production because the fact is is that she's very very high in her DHEA her adrenals are producing way too much um, DHEA and that in and of itself whether or not she's performing more 5-alpha or 5-beta is causing some of her, her androgenic symptoms like oily skin, hair loss, hair growth, rage, irritation. So if we can do some supplements that are going to help upregulate the 5-beta and downregulate or block 
the 5 alpha, then we're going to get a lot of symptomatic control. But at the end of the day, we got to find out, hey, what is stressing this person? Why is this person, um, you know, dealing with such an acute stress response where she's producing so much cortisol at any one time? She has a lot of cortisol that she's using up at the end of the day, and her DHEA is, is through the roof. Um, so we don't want to just think about slowing down an enzyme and, and trying to deal with the, the the, I guess the symptoms like a pill is, um, but we want to try to get to the cause. And we'll talk about that in a second. Now we're looking at her estrogen metabolism. And you can see here that her estrogen metabolism it should be going down this pathway here. And this is called the protective mechanism. And so we want to see 2OH be fairly high. And what we're seeing is her 2OH is about 55% of the total breakdown and it should be 70 percent so we can see that she potentially is having a problem with getting estrogen to go down the protective mechanism in her case her 16 OH which is over here um, should be um, in the 20 percent and she is in the 32.6%. So she is favoring the 16-OH pathway. And potentially that is, um, uh, there's liver SNPs, CYP1B1 or 1A1. We see those on the um, methylation 23andMe panel. And she's probably having a, a SNP in this area here, which means she is not metabolizing estrogen in her phase one metabolism effectively. And she's upregulating her 16-OH metabolism. And that's a problem because the 16-OH pathway is the proliferative pathway. And that's when you have estrogen symptoms, breast tenderness, um, heavy pain, cramping, um, moodiness, some stuff like that. And she, so we want to try to do something that's going to address that. Here is phase two of liver metabolism. And we can see that she is under methylating. Her 2-methoxy ratio to 2-OH is very, very low. And typically, we want to see it around 2 to 1. And you can see she's about 4 to 1. And on this diagram here, we can see that she has low methylation activity. And methylation, again, is through the 23andMe test that we're able to look at and get an idea as to does she have an MTHFR SNP? Does she have an MTR SNP? Does she have a COMT SNP? Because if she does, we want to make sure that we support those SNPs and give the, the cofactors like B2, zinc, um, SAMI, uh, a lot of the factors that are necessary to help those enzymes that aren't working very well. But again, it doesn't take the place of figuring out what's the stressors. I mean, she's in college. She has stressors, and, and potentially we can give her some adaptogens to help calm her, um, not that are going to be stimulants. Something like ashwagandha is very, very calming, and that way that can settle down a little bit of her stress response. But we also want to know, is there any other variables that may be causing her to secrete so much cortisol? And we're going to talk about that in a second. If my computer lets me go here. All right, so so now what we look at is her adrenal hormones. And we can see, we already saw this on page one where her, her, D, her DHEA production is very, very high. Um, and we see her total metabolized cortisol levels are very, very high too. So what we look at here is the ratio between free cortisone, which is the inactive form, and free cortisol, which is the active form. And we can see that she is favoring um, a cortisone which is um, which is helpful. That's protective. Her body is saying, hey, inherently, we're producing way too much free cortisol, and we need to make sure that we try to settle that down a little bit. And that's why this enzyme here, which is called 11-beta-HSD, that's why you see that being um, more towards the cortisone. Your body is basically saying, we got too much free cortisol. It's breaking our tissues down. It's causing us to be worn out. And so what we need to do is instinctively we need to upregulate 11 beta HSD activity towards free cortisone and make it more inactive. So she has a good stress response in terms of her hormones naturally or her enzymes naturally do that. But there are some supplements that we can give her, especially if she's not sleeping at night, like we talked about magnolia or skullcap or zifsifis, um, stuff like that we're going to talk about in a second. Um, 
that's what's so great about this particular test is we can see certain things on here. Like, for example, if her DHEA is high, then we know that potentially um, there are things over here like PCOS, acute stress, Wellbutrin, Xanax, ADD. And I think she told me she had trouble focusing and she had taken some ADD medications. And that's going to cause a, um, an upregulation of her DHEA. Um, a couple other things that we can do to support 5-alpha uh, of slowing down a little bit is um, if we look over here, we want to make sure we want to have 5-beta um, activity um, be, be, up, um, be improved. So things like palmetto, sal palmetto would be very, very helpful um, to be able to lower her 5-alpha activity. So that's that. So that's a pretty good test uh, to determine what's going on. Um, but now we look at her, 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 actually let's go to her wheat zoomer. Her wheat zoomer test. So this is testing whether or not she's got um, leakiness of her gut and if she's got um, food reactivities. And you can see that she is reacting to zonulin. So she has anti-zonulin antibodies in her bloodstream. Zonulin is the protein that helps um, signal the, the gut wall to open up to allow the passage of food and nutrients into there. And so when we have zonulin or anti-zonulin in our bloodstream, it means that it's penetrating into our immune system where it shouldn't be and it tells us that we have leaky gut. She also has anti-actin which means her own immune system is reacting against other protein structures of her wall and she also has high lipopolysaccharides which means she has unhealthy um, gut bacteria or dysbiosis in her gut and that itself along with the stressed um, schedule, deadlines, um, not eating healthy, waiting too long between meals is going to create all of that adrenal stress response. But here's where I really want you to see the picture is she is reacting to all sorts of peptides in wheat. So there's wheat germ agglutinin, she's off the charts. So there's gliadin, she's off the charts. There is uh, glutenin, and she's off the charts. And then there's these non-gluten wheat panels, she's off the charts. I mean, this is quite profound. And then she's reacting to transglutaminase 3, which is an antibody, um, which is an antigen, which is found in her skin. And that means that potentially that could cause some of the dermatitis, hepiformis. Um, and she is getting skin irritations as well. So it's not, she's got a couple things going on. The last thing we look at is her cross-reactive foods. And you can see she's reacting reacting to hemp, millet, um, tapioca, teff, soy, egg, corn, rice, and potato. And so we need to remove those foods from her diet, and we also would need to remove gluten from her diet. We need to settle down her immune system by doing some gut repair protocols. We also need to try to help 11-beta um, HSD activity a little bit more. We also want to try to help lower um, cort cortisol, so maybe we can give her some phosphatidylserine and some adaptogens, and then try to manage her from that way. So um, hopefully you got a little bit of information today. I really find that doing these case studies with you guys is very, very helpful. Um, you know, this patient is, is doing well. I haven't seen her for a while because, you know, that just happens. We've called her a couple times to get her back to see how she's doing. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't heard from her. So, um, but the point is, is that we can see a lot of connections between um, gut breakdown, blood inst instability, um, stress, um, adrenal or, um, or, or hormone excess activity, and then the development of PCOS. And, and this is a huge problem. So hopefully got a lot of value out of this. My name is Dr. Joel Rosen. Um, I help patients with interpreting their Dutch tests. I ordered the Dutch tests. I ordered the, um, the cross-reactive test, which is what you're looking at right now. I ordered the wheat zoomer test, which is this one here. And these are really, really great tests. So hopefully you found this very, very informative. And I look forward to giving you some more help in the future. Thank you so much.